travel has enjoyed steady growth in the last few years and funding to innovative startups soared. But along came the coronavirus to break up the party. So what happens next? Please welcome our panel of analysts and investors to discuss. Joining me today are Yaroslav Chernik, investment partner, Rockaway Capital, Neil Glynn, managing director at Credit Suisse, Christoph Schu, partner, Lakestar, and Sean Seton Rogers, general partner at ProFounders Capital. Hi, all. Welcome. It's good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. So, COVID kind of appended everything, right? Um, let's start off just talking about uh, the biggest challenges that you face with your portfolios, or Neil, in your case you know, uh, the transport sector, what have you seen um, that has perhaps been kind of the biggest challenge, you would say, uh, for travel? Sean, let's start with you. Yeah, happy, happy to jump in here. And we are an early stage investor, but we have quite a broad remit. So we invested in a number of travel companies. We also invested in e-commerce companies, games companies. So e-commerce games, absolutely flying, best times, people are stuck at home, they hate that sofa, they need something new and nice, they hop online and buy something. Obviously, travel has had uh, the exact opposite of that. And so I think the biggest challenge for us as investors is that we are not directly in control of these companies. And so the, what we have to do is we have to work with our portfolio to recognize um, the challenges that they face and work with them to strategize and understand um, what they can do to to basically live to fight another day. Uh, I hate to be that brutal about it, but it has been incredibly tough for so many companies. In fact, I've learned a new term called a minimum viable business, which is what it takes, what you can do to reduce your expenditure, your costs, everything down as much as possible to create as much time for the world to return to some sense of normalcy. And so we spent a lot of time with travel companies on that side of things, and then also partially playing psychologist. I mean, this is a very tough time if you have given up a high paying job, you set up a company uh, and, and you have expectations to build something big uh, and then these uh, the, these times hit. So it's been um, it's probably been one of the busiest time periods we've ever had as early stage investors. I love that term, minimum viable business. Uh, Christoph, you, you're kind of in the in the same boat. Uh, you know, you have a portfolio yeah. of companies that depend on you. Anything to add to what Sean said? Yeah, we are, let's say, European uh, investor, we have invested into Get Your Guide, Home to Go, Omeo, Mapify, <clears throat> um, and others. And uh, I have to say that it was really strange. So we had companies were, which were growing above 100%, and three weeks later, they were on zero revenues. So um, I think what, what we did um, was just to be supportive on the financing side so that the companies get properly financed on the one hand. So we wanted to make sure that each of our traveling company has, let's say, 24 months minimum financing. Uh, that's what we did on the one hand. Then, of course, the, um, the um, recovery scenario planning, which was a weekly exercise with a lot of portfolio companies, and we were trying to share, let's say, insights from, from other companies um, who can give us, let's say, movement data, and, and then we could track what happens in different cities. And I think what we also wanted to take care of is that they still invest into the product and into supply side. I think that was an important element for us that we stop, of course, uh, let's say, in customer on the customer acquisition side, but we wanted to make sure that we have a product when recovery happens, which is top in class and which can which can be a category winner. So for us as investors, uh, so we we are tend to invest a bit later in in categories like tours and attractions. We invested really late in Get Your Guide. We invested invested really late in Home to Go as a vacation rental player and others. But then we want to make sure that the product is the best uh, in class, and that's why we we were really strict on saying, hey, keep on investing in product, but stop marketing and all others. So that was the advice we gave. That's uh, great advice. And Yaroslav, coming to you on the OTA side, especially, that that's a tough business to be in um, right now. Yes. So what have you seen? What are the challenges there? 
It, it is. I think for us, uh, I mean, it's, it's very similar as, as, as for the other guys. I mean, the problem is that our business basically evaporated overnight. I mean, it went really from, uh, you know, we had a huge decline over, you know, space of days where you suddenly had borders closed and, uh, you know, 90% of your business wasn't there, right? So it's... Uh, it was the same situation. The problem that we were also facing is the unpredictability, right? On, on one hand, you want to invest, you want to sort of be ready for the future. You put, you know, you step on brakes uh, with respect to cost and the, the, any any unnecessary cash outflows. On the other hand, you don't want to jeopardize your future and then you, you have to invest. And um, the problem is that, um, which we see is the, is a lack of lack of outlook no one knows whether it's going to be for 12 18 24 months right and so so this is this you know everyone hopes and wants to be you know prepared by uh, but at the same time we didn't know whether recovery will happen over the summer now we see a second wave and um, it's very difficult to predict the the, the future on this but uh, the measures were very similar to what uh, christoph uh, said and, and, and sorry if I can jump in here. I think an also an important thing to think about is the um, liquidity of the business as well, right? I think for different businesses, uh, depending on the cash balance uh, and the cost structure, uh, it's easier to invest in product um, than it is for others, right? So we're also investors in Get Your Guide, and luckily uh, they were fortunate timing wise to to raise a large round of financing last year, which leaves them very well positioned to invest in product and come out as one of the strongest, uh, continue to be one of the strongest players in the space. We have other investments um, that'll remain nameless who aren't quite as lucky from a cash balance perspective. And um, it's been tough. It, it really is about trying to contract as much as possible and really uh, be positioned to be able to come back when the markets reopen um, for travel, tourism, leisure, et cetera. What, yeah, if, and if I may step in here, what we were actually, we took, a, we took a, one extra step here. We're saying basically, uh, what can we do what we would otherwise not be able to do? I mean, we have a you know, fairly large business, uh, you know, operating across several countries, uh, you know, generating a lot of money. Suddenly you were at zero. And under normal circumstances, you would be more cautious than on, on, as if we were a startup with experimenting. I think at this moment, we have the benefit of, of doing steps that you wouldn't be able to do uh, under normal circumstances. Because you know, much worse. It cannot really get much worse than that, right? So it it it, it opens up um, opportunities. On the other hand, so try to look from from a positive angle here. Right, and I think Christoph made that that point about investing in in product and really focusing on on the product. Um, at at this point in time, we're seeing that across sectors. I'm going to come to you, Neil. Um, obviously, you follow the transport sector uh, quite closely. Um, and, and the challenges there, uh, especially on the airline side, are um, pretty well documented, shall we say. Um, Absolutely. But what are, what are you seeing in terms of sort of some of the, the adjustments that the airlines are making or, uh, you know, the adaptations that, that they're going through um, just to make it through? <laughs> Yeah, so we've so across our coverage, we focus on the airline sector. We focus on travel distribution. So maybe a, a little bit of overlap um, with the OTA side, for example, as well as we focus on the logistics space. So there has been actually quite a dichotomy of um, experiences, uh, as you touch on clearly on the airline side. The number one, two, and, and three consideration has been liquidity, and those. Who have had access to it have uh, moved at varying paces uh, and we're starting to see a lot more or we have seen a lot more transactions happen over the last few uh, few months than we have ever seen over the past 10 years or so uh, which is perhaps stating the obvious um, but on the other side of the spectrum we have actually had companies on the logistics side who have really really benefited from e-commerce uh, most notably uh, back to I think it was Sean mentioned the people fed up fed up just sitting on their couch and want to actually you know, maybe enrich their lives through online purchases uh, to the extent that they can and the tight management of capacity from companies such as uh, airlines, container shipping companies, trucking companies, has actually meant that uh, rates have been very, very strong. Air freight rates have doubled actually in the second quarter. And 
the focus on what companies actually will do with that cash has become more and more evident. And I think we are certainly seeing year to date that strong companies are continuing to invest, to invest in things like digitization, securing future growth opportunities. And I think in terms of how investment develops over the next uh, couple of years, the strong investing to uh, retain some benefits of this uh, current dire situation will actually be quite a big theme for technology investment in the transport space over the next few years. Uh, more so on the logistics side, but we will also have travel distribution companies of which there are some very strong ones in the world. I would expect to use this as an opportunity to invest to improve their quality relative to the quality of some of their competitors that simply can't afford to do that. So you're, you're saying that travel distribution companies are going to get stronger or, or the larger ones are going to get um, stronger because they have so the ability? Some, so some will. Like, across, I think across all very challenged industries of which there are clearly a number at the moment, history tells us that if you look towards the global financial crisis, for example, uh, if you look towards periods of challenge between the global financial crisis and today, you've seen a number of experiences that suggest that the strong get stronger, the weak get weaker when a crisis hits. Sometimes that comes via, if you think about on the airline side, airline failures. Uh, if you think about on the logistics as well as the travel technology side, M&A has been ever present uh, over the last decade and you could say as far back as, uh, as anybody can remember. And M&A opportunities uh, usually come up as a result of crises and uh, that's certainly one thing that we're, we're focused on so far. Um, and there have been a number of companies that we focus on that have been quite uh, open about their uh, openness or their willingness to look for M&A candidates. So I think that that will be one manifestation of a will to use this year to structurally improve competitive positioning. And Sean, Christoph, oh, I'm sorry, Lorraine, please jump in. A few audience questions, but one of them is asking about investment opportunities as we see potential consolidation between online travel providers. Well, maybe I, I step in here on what we see or where I see the opportunity is really that, uh, uh, you know, what, um, what was mentioned here, there is a you know, potential M&A opportunities. I think was, it's not a great time for exits at this moment. I think everyone agrees on that. Um, but um, I think the, the situation can create a new opportunity and we're strong, get stronger uh, with, with a sort of midterm outlook. So combining forces and I think the, also the ecosystem will be changing uh, the way that uh, online business is, uh, is evolving. Online across the board was benefiting. Um, Sean was mentioning gaming, e-commerce, etc. I think we see it from our portfolio. Um, but the whole shift uh, offline to online in, in travel will be uh, or is happening and will be only accelerated. And I think mobile shift is contributing to this as well. Uh, so online businesses uh, will will get stronger, I think, and also uh, scale matters in this game. So uh, So this can create opportunities. Yeah, the, the unfortunate thing, I suppose, about M&A right now, it's it's a little bit of the old adage about in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, um, because uh, no no one's doing particularly well. Everyone's share price is down, um, but it might not be as down as others, and you might have more cash than others, and to buy might be cheap, but it's definitely not a fun time for, for investors, uh, at least pri private investors, into these companies now. And I think thinking about it from the perspective of smaller companies uh, where their owners historically will have had maybe high expectations about an exit price, not, not, not that that necessarily changes today, but one thing that might change, whether it's from a technology perspective or the the non-technology operations of the business, including um, the, the people that a business employs, a lot of businesses are going to be facing down quite heavy restructuring programs at the moment. So certainly in some industries, uh, you will have some business owners that basically don't 
uh, want to do that, aren't prepared to enter what might well be quite a long slog. And that could potentially be influential in some decision making that could ultimately lead to M&A. It might sound tangential, but we've had that in the logistics space over recent years where, for example, long term family ownerships uh, have ultimately ended uh, because of a need to invest in new technology. And also a recognition, I think, as Yaroslav mentioned, that scale really matters and eventually um, decisions can be made to accept that. What we, <clears throat> just to add on that, what we see as an interesting trend is not just the M&A as an opportunity, but also to do asset deals. So some OTAs have done in the past a lot, but only one or two things really good. And they are thinking about at the moment to sell part of their business as an asset deal. And I think that is super interesting. So if you are a strong winner in one category and you, you look around, you see in the OTA business, some of them doing that as a side business. And if you can then acquire that business, I think that's that's super interesting. And I, I think the second dimension, which is for us interesting to, to look at is the post COVID new normal. How does it look like? Um, think about the vacation rental as which can over take the hotel business in the future. So um, I think there are a lot of opportunities for, um, for let's say, for that kind of inventory, which is vacation rental inventory, and that will stay. People are testing vacation rental this year, and they like it, and, and maybe they don't uh, use a suite in a hotel next year. They use a vacation rental and others. So I think the, the, the M&A uh, is not the only opportunity. I think smart investors now looking for, let's say, side businesses to acquire. Thanks, Schroeder. I'm, I'm actually going to jump on, on what you said there, Christoph, about smart businesses jumping into, you know, other areas. So what are you, what other than, um, you know, vacation rentals, what other areas are you looking at? What would be a smart move um, at the moment? I think, uh, let's say from, from a tech pers perspective, what we like are API infrastructure players like Impala, where we have invested in, in the hotel infrastructure PMS uh, play. So uh, this kind of technologies can be helpful to enable in the future, uh, let's say other companies who are in the consumer space to, uh, can, to combine kind of their products with, with a travel product or to package it. And, and, and what we really like is this kind of enabling technology, which, uh, which uh, let's, let's say enlarges the opportunity for the inventory owner not to be too dependent on just the classical GDSs or others, but find other ways of distribution. And I think demand and distribution is really important uh, for the future. And that's why uh, we really look into this kind of API infrastructure player in the travel and transportation market. Yeah, just to jump in from an early stage investor perspective, um, it's we're trying to balance two things. One is that clearly it's it's tough to convince people to put money to work in in the travel sector right now. But we all hope and pray and believe that this is a short term sort of um, impact. Um, so actually, as people that write checks from half a million to a million and a half, uh, we actually think this could be an interesting time because the kinds of businesses that we invest in wouldn't be bringing product to market for at least probably a year or so, and especially on the B2B side. So it could be a nice time to look at what's taking place, look at some of the trends going on in the industry, put money to work with the idea that when these companies come to market and need to start selling, it will be when the markets have recovered, customers are more open, uh, businesses are more open to new technologies as well. So you're, you're kind of saying you're looking at it not from the short, medium term, but rather the, the long term view of it. Right. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because uh, as early stage investors, we, we do tend to think, or we try to hope that we can think five to seven years down the road about what these companies could look like. Um, and so it is a little bit of a of a bold uh, bet, but we do believe that, you know, we, we honestly believe things will be coming back in the next year. Um, in fact, in the, in the short term, if anyone is bolder than I am, they could really, uh, if they have faith, make a lot of money by investing in a lot of these uh, public travel companies right now. But I'll leave that to Neil to decide whether or not... Uh, it's a good thing to do. Yeah. And Neil, what are your thoughts on recovery? Sean's confident it's all going to come back um, in the next year or so. 
yeah, or at least I mean, start coming back, right? Well, I guess the from a from a very short term perspective, uh, the the most recent um, news flow clearly we're all digesting on a daily basis. But uh, in terms of the industry news flow, uh, there's obviously a lot of lobbying about um, travel corridors and and airport testing and the the necessity of quarantines or not, um, but. Unfortunately, at the moment, most airlines who have been outlining winter capacity uh, plans are gently rowing them back. Um, so that has been quite disappointing, but not wholly surprising, I would say. Uh, anybody that pays attention to the news flow can kind of figure out that there is a risk on that. I think what most airlines are trying to um, focus on and trying to understand is the outlook for next summer. There has been some positive commentary from travel groups such as TUI talking about very, very strong levels of forward bookings as early as it is for summer 2021. Uh, but the next few next few months, I think uh, around the Christmas period into January will be extremely important uh, for co- consumer uh, and potential passenger appetite to travel. Um, some of the experience so far has suggested that there is definitely a level of resilience within demand. Um, And I think it's going to be very important to understand uh, how people ultimately get through this winter period. If we end up seeing a winter which is partially locked down, where the weather in theory will be quite different to certainly the the periods of glorious weather we've had uh, over the last few months, I think that may also impact appetite to travel But I think most, um, to quote, for example, United Airlines said very recently they don't expect more than a 50% level of demand for traffic until there's a vaccine widely available. Um, Virgin Atlantic recently said 50% revenues next year relative to 2019. So that seems to be getting towards where some parts of the industry are, are, are framing things. But once there's a vaccine, I think... Confidence Things will change well. pretty pretty quickly. Yeah. You think, Yaroslav, from your perspective, just very quickly, um, recovery is on the horizon. Well, we we hope for for it, but no one can really tell. I mean, uh, I think people are a bit more, uh, you know, cautious because no one can really predict. So I think people will be focusing more on on last minute booking uh, than than you know way in advance. So I think for the next couple of months it will be quieter. Great. Well, we have to leave it there. Um, I know we could we could go on for for a while. This is such an interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Sean, Yaroslav, Christoph, Neil, for joining us today. Um, we hope to see you back again in person um, next year in in Amsterdam. Thank you again. Thank you. Here. Thank you. Thank you.